Hi there, my name is Dane Grunewald, CEO of Huddle3 Group. And uh, it's great to be welcoming Simon Finn to the Future of Teamwork podcast today. Simon's the president and CEO of Beyond the Break, which is probably one of my favorite names of a business I've ever come across as a surfer. And uh, that's something that we both share in common. Um, so uh, welcome to the uh, podcast, Simon. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Lovely to be having a chat with you. Absolutely. I think uh, we, probably the last time we were together in person, we were likely sitting down in Greenspoint in Houston talking about some of the, uh, the work that, that you and the team were doing for, for drilling uh, operations right around the world, um, which was pretty cool. Uh, and you've, you bring a lot of psychology and, and some, some really good behavioral practices to that, putting these teams together and making them uh, function in a safe way. So uh, I've always been intrigued by the way you do your work, but perhaps for our listeners, you could give us a little bit of background on who you are and how you've sort of come into that line of business um, and, and what you're doing now. Sure. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm obviously Australian. I was, I was born in a small city called Adelaide. Um, uh, went through school without much skill in mathematics or science. And for whatever reason, I, I just had a bit of a knack in understanding uh, at a young age why people were either happy or unhappy or wanting to do things with me or not wanting to do things with me. And, and at a young age, I started to work things out. So fortunately at school, someone said, look, you're not going to be the next um, king of physics or, or a mathematician on the Fields Medal, but why don't you give the humanities a go? So. I was very fortunate at a young age going through school and, and ended up going to university and doing my um, undergraduate degree and then postgrad qualifications around um, human behaviour and, and around that area of organisational psychology. So that's what uh, my formal training is. And then um, I ended up doing what, I've, what I'm doing now about 20 years ago. And in between, I was in the corporate world for a little while, which I didn't enjoy as much. So... In short, I've always had an interest in people and um, it's probably in the latter years you you understand what you're good at and what you're not as good at. And I, I tend to believe in working on your strengths and recognising those weaknesses, get somebody else to help. Oh, that's really neat. And uh, I know from our surf discussions that, and we're here to talk about teamwork today, but you surfing for me has always been an individual sport, but you've turned surfing into a team sport too, surfing some pretty big waves on tandem boards. Look, I'm, I'm really, really fortunate. Um, my, my wife is, is kind of tiny um, and I've got a love of history. So uh, Hawaii has given us pretty much the world of surfing and water sports. And I, was, I always found that wonderfully romantic. Yeah. Uh, around tandem surfing. So we've probably done that tech for the last 15 years. Um, and it's just been a wonderful part of our life. So yes, I do tandem surf. We don't compete anymore, but we did that for, for a while and loved it. So um, it's interesting. But on, on the, that aspect of teamwork, um, in tandem surfing, a lot of people have tried it over the years and they've been wonderful surfers, yeah. professional surfers or highly competent surfers, and they just don't gel well. Um, tandem surfing works when when one person allows the other person to lead and they work together as a team. So Nicole and I have been really lucky in that part. She's She never surfed in her life. Oh. She was a really good water skater. So we were able to work together and we were able to succeed well in that area. And I think it comes back to a lot of, really good teams whenever you observe them is that people not everyone tries to be the boss and people realize what they're good at and whoever is leading that team allows people to fulfill those roles and i i think that's helped us as so well. it's a little bit more like ballroom dancing than extreme sports look a lot yeah. a lot um in big waves it's a little different it's sort of take off and hang on and make sure you all survive yeah. Um, but look, in, in, in general competition, when we do that, it's a mix between ballroom and acro when it comes to the ability of two people to do things together. Yeah. So in the US, you find a lot of um, uh, cheerleaders or acro gymnastics yes. are really good at it. Um, in Australia, we don't have that, of course, so we're, we're at a, a different level. But 
Yeah, it's interesting working together in that. And way. I've seen some pictures. You and Nicole aren't afraid of charging some bigger waves. I think I saw a picture of you at Padang Padang in Indonesia, which was a wave I would have been scared to surf. Yes, well, it, we Padang Padang, I've surfed that on my own. We haven't surfed a tandem. We've, oh, right. we've surfed that just a, a couple of hundred metres down a break called Impossibles. Yes. Um, and we've also surfed Uluwatu, um, not, you know, at, at – death defying levels but you know two to three times overhead's enough for us but uh, we're we're very much those years behind us now we um we look more for the the gentle noosa kind of waves or in the us the rincon malibu kind of waves yeah uh, where we can where we can have a a coffee afterwards that's that's more uh more i go that's neat so um going from teamwork in the ocean to teamwork on a drill rig uh what what was it that first sort of caught your eye gave you that introduction to working with drilling teams it's a it's a very unique work environment look back um 20 22 years ago um i was working in the corporate world um and i just didn't enjoy it and my neighbor was involved in um an area working in australia with a client that had been involved in a, a pretty significant fatality which had um made the headlines in in australia and it shut down uh, the biggest gas plant which affected the east coast of australia millions and millions of people and um i was invited to go along and and spend some time in, involved in that area and i was just intrigued about how people were handling this situation and it wasn't necessarily conducive conducive to long-term team growth people were looking for accountability um and finding out who was responsible rather yeah. than working out how this situation occur. And it just struck me then that you've got hundreds of people affected in this. They're all teams, they're all tribes, they're all clans working together, but no one's feeling part of this because no one's dealing with the, the huge issue, which was there's a massive loss here. Mm-hmm. There was a massive loss of life. Um, there was long-term legacy issues but they weren't dealing with them and from that I, I was just fortunate to meet some people in the us that gave me an opportunity and and off we went and uh, the last 20 years has been this ongoing journey of of seeing how people interact really when you've got sometimes good leaders and bad leaders that can form good or bad teams sometimes in alignment with that good leadership or bad leadership but sometimes completely against it they they form really good teams because the leadership's so bad and sometimes when the leadership is really good it it doesn't allow the teams to thrive as much as they should because it's too hands off so that's how i ended up and it's just been an interesting ride ever since yeah and that's an interesting concept of the the bad leader but a good team can still emerge um, and 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 the converse of that. But if you think about that bad leader, good team scenario, what is it that allows that team to come together and to forge it for themselves, forge that teamwork, that good safety behaviour culture? It, look, it's a good question. I think too often in organisations, Dane, and you have seen this many times over your career, managers are appointed and they're called leaders, yeah. but it's not actually the people are saying, this is the person I want to be led by. Yes. So you may have a manager appointed to a position. They may be an exceptional engineer. They may be a wonderful accountant, a great lawyer. They may have great hard skills, but their hard skills got them to a position, but not necessarily what we would call soft skills. I don't want to call them soft skills, but I'm being broadly speaking here. Yeah. And that's the ability to understand how people operate. So if a if a poor leader, a bad leader ends up leading people and they realise that this is not the guy or the gal that should be leading me, they more often than not will form their own teams to protect one another and to protect the culture that they've developed. Yeah. Irrespective of the manager who is there attending to lead them. Yeah, that's interesting. I've heard there's a speaker that I watched, Eric Coriol, that talked about teams surviving bad leaders and that sometimes that, that yes. is an impetus um, to, to do just that. Look, it's, it's really interesting when you say teams surviving bad leaders is that 
uh, our work over the last 20 years has been going on and off all rigs around the world and observing behaviour that can contribute to poor safe practice. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, the the issue is the person at the top. Yeah. More often than not, it's the person who is the greatest influence on on that operation. Now, if that person is a micromanager, um, corporately, they're probably doing the right thing. They're, they're making sure everything is working as it should operationally or accountably in one way. But they're not necessarily giving the crews, the team, the confidence and in turn that competence that, that confidence in their competence to do what's required of them safely. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have great teams that can be sustaining high perform performance. So it's an interesting scenario is that regretfully my experience would suggest um, a poor leader or a poor manager of people doesn't allow teams to thrive. Yeah. I, uh, th that same speaker, Eric Coriol, talked about team behaviours, team dynamics, um, referencing old military kind of structure because a lot of organisational behaviour was originally studied in the military and he talked about the sort of think, tell, do uh, structure. Yes. And, and it was really interesting because I'm now currently reading one of Bern Bernard Cornwall's books on the Sharp series and he's in his early 1800s. Right. He's a guy that gets promoted out of the ranks. And, and to what you've just said and to what Eric talked about, there's this concept that the officers were standing behind these, you know, these the fighting men um, who, who were generally looking towards their, their corporals and their sergeants, sergeant majors for, for the real behavioral get to know each other, know how to, you know, spark each other up and make the right calls in the field. And the officers were standing behind just kind of closing the ranks when someone got shot and went down or communicating messages, but they weren't really part of the team. Um, mm. and, and it's fascinating kind of thinking about that dynamic, you know, 220 years ago in a military environment and seeing that it still exists in some teams today. Uh, and, you know, I think through COVID, we're seeing, unfortunately, some of those... Uh, I, I think some of those dynamics are almost becoming more prevalent again because of remote work and, and you've got this detachment of certain leaders from their teams and probably not in a drill site environment because you can't have a hybrid, you know, completion supervisor or, 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 or night, you know, man there on, on the site, company man on the site. But um, definitely in a lot of businesses, it's, it, it is something that we're having to tackle almost over again. Look, it's... The work, the, what you're saying there, um, there's a lot of work that's recently coming out globally around that. Yeah. Um, there's an Australian by the name of Duncan Young, who's the um, head of wellbeing for Len Lease, which is a significant yeah. company in Australia. Um, he's recognised this quite a lot, that there's a lack of collaboration because the normal interpersonal cues that we take from teams when we're together are no longer there. And that we've moved more in a binary fashion where people are feeling that someone is with me or against me through connection in um, an artificial communicative world, such as yeah. this, where we're, where we're talking online. And that's been really interesting. You can see globally that companies are wanting their teams to come back and spend time with one another. Other companies are saying, look, we'll, we'll make it work for whatever reason. But I think we're going to see a huge amount of study come out of in the next few years about how we're going to handle this. Yeah. I, for one, really do enjoy seeing people be able to thrash out issues when they're together and then have that opportunity for resolution and resolve and sometimes seeing a different point of view outside of that formal teamwork when we're together we might be having a you know some quiet time afterwards or before we we negate the need to allow people to spend time with one another not necessarily discussing work but discussing yeah. things that bring them together which allows them to function so i think it's an interesting time on that matter yeah it really is and i think part of it's going to be coming up with different ways to get together and collaborate um and then another part will be 
what technology evolves, um, you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, what, what evolves to allow us to have better interaction when we are virtual. Because right now, you know, we've gone a long way from dial-up telephone calls to video calls, but I still think there's a long way further that technology can go in driving that collaboration where we have to rely on it. It's Look, it's affected our business unbelievably mm -hmm. the last two years. Um, I looked between 20, uh, June 2009 and, say, March 2020 when, when I came back to Sydney. Yeah. I averaged 70 flights a year and I was away from home around 100 nights a year. And more often than not, that was visiting our teams wherever they were around the globe working and visiting our clients and working with them. And if there was an issue, quickly jumping on a plane and, and resolving that face-to-face. -face. Yeah. And it was done it was done easily and well and generally in good faith. When you're in front of someone, you can you can see if they're upset, whether they're stressed, and you can work through those issues personally face-to-face. -face. Yeah. When you're doing that through Zoom, that, that's near impossible, yeah. despite what people say. Yeah. And the last few years has been really challenging for me in an area where I'm used to human interaction. I'm used to seeing how someone's uh, eyes respond to a conversation, little little things around facial movements, or you can see sweat forming if, yeah. if it is one of those conversations. You, you can't do that online. No. So it's been immensely challenging for us, and we've had to find ways around that. And as soon as we can get back traveling as freely as we'd like to, that's what we'll be doing. But I personally have noticed it, and um, I, I don't know how a generation coming through will will see um, a mediary of communication that has been normal to, um, say, someone who's already been doing this for 10 or 15 years beforehand. Yeah. Well, I can definitely see it in, in our teams and some of our customers' teams that conflict is now being managed more through text than through conversation, which is dangerous. Um, yes, and you do you do wonder how, or it's or it's not being addressed. The conflict is being avoided, and that's even more dangerous. Um, so I think that there's definitely going to be, like you say, a lot of studies that come out of it. And you're going to see the companies that I think perform well are the ones that find ways to, you know, embrace that conflict, embrace that learning opportunity by getting people together. Uh, and, yeah, and maybe who knows? I mean, I I'm not a technologist, but I keep looking at all of this talk about the metaverse and people being able to have avatars and maybe in the future you will be able to put goggles on and you'll be able to see the sweat forming on whatever their avatar is and you'll be able to see that their arms are crossed really tight or whatever it is in their body language but we're a long way from that yes we are it's it look it's just interesting times yeah. and i've got to be conscious i'm on, on the other side of 50 now so uh, I, i've been you know in the in the workforce for 35 years so i see the world quite differently to my children who are in their early 20s and in and going off in their different endeavors yeah. so it, it is very different how we're viewing it and we're seeing that the boomers move out of the workplace so how are we working around this i don't know but i i'm just going back to something that's been proven for hundreds of years is that the interaction of people in, in a small group, that can be a, a small team of three to four people up to a larger team, and I don't think teams function that well over eight to ten, which, yeah. which does follow that traditional um, army model. Um, how they're going to interact if they're not together being able to um, thrash out issues. And you mentioned something really important, and that is when conflict's avoided. Yeah. When conflict's avoided for too long, it's precarious, it's dangerous. It doesn't engender trust. And it doesn't allow teams to resolve failure. Yeah. And that's hugely important. Yeah. I know there was a study, one of my good friends in, in Swansea in Wales, actually, he's a, a doctor. He works in intensive care and they do a lot of training out there in the NHS around safety. <laughs> and uh, one of the case studies they went through was a nurse who, due to the hierarchy and the surgery, wouldn't engage in conflict with the surgeon who was perhaps overlooking being a bit complacent around some you know use of surgical equipment or washing up or whatever it was and that was creating more uh 
infections from from surgery which were ending up in icu and and that's a perfect example of where the conflict people see what's going wrong but they're not willing to have the conflict and that hurts the patient it hurts the hospital it hurts the morale of the team it, it, it can be very uh it, it really the, the rot really sets in when that becomes typical yes it is look it brings in an interesting scenario in society when we have imagined class structure or imagined status structure and real class, real status structure. Yeah. Something we've learnt is that, um, and I'll use the English system and the American system, um, in, in the Great War, World War I, we saw massive failures between the the, the British army structure, which was the officer structure, were generally people of class, yes. of means, and status, that were living in a pre-world of the Crimea War or a world of uh, Nepo um, Wellington yeah. and going back to the Crimean War. It's, it was it was a, 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 a living a life that was no longer present. And, and, and in the Great War, they weren't able to communicate with their with their men there was just no association. It, it, it didn't have some understanding. And that carried through to World War II. What we saw in the US system was quite different. That class structure, that status structure wasn't there. And the the US um, army system was unbelievably successful in World War II because there wasn't that great divide yep. between those of authority and those who were um, delegated to deliver those commands. Yeah. So that was interesting. And I... I think in in Australian history, we we've never really had that class structure. We haven't had that um, status structure in uh, the way in which Australians resolved um, conflict during World War One between officers and and soldiers was very very different to the way in which the British did. Yeah. And we've learned a lot from team structures there. What's of note though is that, and I might be speaking uh, against the trend here, is that. In some ways, in in the US, it's become as much of a British system because of the the private college college system, private university system. That people come out, and there is a belief that they will be a leader in business, yes. and they're not able to um, communicate, or they're not able to understand how the person who has not been given that privilege or that opportunity thinks and how they interact. And I I think we're we're just seeing that. In a lot of business functions now, we're seeing that in in greater society, whether it's politics as well. Yeah, I like the way you talk about it as, you know, it may be an actual class structure or status structure or, or one that, that may be just perceived there too. And, and I think you're right, it is perceived when it's which school did a leader go to or what qualification do they have, but but also what company they work for. So if you go back to the work you've done on, on the drilling rigs, you've got... The operator and then you've got the drilling contractor and then you might have other subcontractors and teams in there and you've got expatriate talent and regional talent i mean you've seen some no doubt some very different structures status structures in in that uh operating environment um what, what are as, as those types of structures become identified you know as the world continues to go forwards what are some of the key learnings that you took away from those more diverse, more fragmented uh, drilling teams that you went in and built safety cultures with? Gee, it, it's an interesting scenario because quite often the quietest voice in the room um, has a great deal of knowledge but isn't heard yeah. because of perceived structures. Now, I, I don't suggest that someone who has come in as the uh, what we may refer to as the company man or someone who is the OIM or, yeah. or someone of influence and power is a negative individual. But there is perceptions of status that when that person is speaking, it's, it's the truth, it's the way to go. Yet that person that's receiving the message may well have worked on eight to 10 different operations over the last um, six to 12 months. Yeah. And they've they've been involved in one task and that task is replicated no matter where they've gone. Yet that person who is running that operation, that rig or the company man, they may be there for 12 months. They've never seen it before. Yeah. So it's that, it's that need to be able to um, have, have 
have an environment where where that quiet, silent person has the courage to say, look, stop, I have seen this before, why don't we try this? Yeah. And the leader to be able to say, in this instance, I don't know the best way forward, I'm all in That ears. vulnerability. And that's, that's really challenging to do when you're seen there as the God who should know the answer for everything and that's just not possible. Yeah. That's, uh, I read a lot about psychological safety right now in a lot of these work place articles um which i think helps encourage that quiet voice to to feel confident to be able to stand up and say something without retribution um was there a way that you i know you use video a lot on the kickoff of some of the drilling campaigns but were there any sort of tips and tricks or or rituals that you would build in uh, when you would go and work with a new group to help try and create that psychological safety that that awareness of of the value of the team look it's it's difficult because when someone like us someone like me is, is going on to an operation uh, people are nervous you know what are you there to do yeah and when you say look we're trying to bring the best out of people we're trying to see teams function in a way which allows uh, safe work or performance to be sustained yeah it, it's hard to believe I, I like to have a, a quiet conversation with uh, the people who are running the show, the the, the company man, the, the drilling supervisors, the OAM, and say, what works well and what doesn't work well? Yeah. And then find a way to communicate with crews, and that's not going to happen in one or two days. It will take quite a while until people loosen up and say, what works well, what doesn't work well? Uh-huh. And sometimes it's per- perceived status it's perceived control it's perceived jealousy and it's not actually there yeah so it's finding ways to disarm those those preconceived ideas that are not necessarily there we i do like using video in a way with that disarms people you can get a lesson across quite easily yeah um more often than not on a on a drilling rig no matter where it is around the world you will have um, meeting twice a day, a pre-tail meeting where um, that may be in the morning shift or the evening shift and they say what's going on. And then once a week you have a safety shutdown meeting. If, if that is regurgitative and it's a PowerPoint presentation or someone is delivering a company line, people will forget it within 20 minutes yeah. and by the time they wake up in the morning, they can't remember it all. If you can find a way to deliver a message on video that includes those people and they run it and Today, you can easily do it with an iPhone. Yeah. People remember it. And you've got a chance to deliver a very simple message, sometimes in a humorous way, sometimes in a serious way. It depends on what it needs to be done. But yeah. it allows people to have control of that message. So number one, try and seek out what the perceptions are and then try and address them in a way that doesn't that doesn't demean others and also allows you to bring people along on a journey. And I don't always like using that word journey, but... You've got to bring people along on this on this pathway with you. Yeah. There's actually a great entrepreneur that I'm doing some work with right now over in the UK, Nicholas Sykes. He's got a business called Process Stories, which is just starting. And what you just said there, I think, is something that he's identifying as well. So you mentioned, you know, understand where those perspectives are, but then find a way to bring the team into it to be part of the message. And he had a group of individuals who were rather creative. They didn't like reading standard operating procedures and doing the regular toolbox meetings. And just by chance, he, he was being playful. He started creating some sort of graphic novels to talk about how they would work together on the team. And then he started asking them to contribute to this graphic novel to say, is this really the best process and what are we missing? And it became a bit of a ritual for the team to kind of over time let that graphic novel of the standard operating procedure evolve. And so now he's being a bit playful with that and creating these videos and, and having this like real time interaction and almost chat function around the video and, Hey, that didn't actually work this week. And we've got a problem. What do you guys think we do with this? And the team ends up creating the best practices for you rather than some, you know, brains trust back at corporate. And, and to your point, they then feel like they they own it. They're a part of it. It's it's safe to speak up about it. Um, so I'm I'm intrigued by that whole 
space. I've not done a lot of work with it. I've seen some of your videos, but uh, it's a good way to sort of democratize um, team behavior and and team evolution. The the term you've used there is a ripper, the democratization of team behavior. Um, Teams by their very nature will only work if they are democratic. Yeah. And that is allowing the team to say, at this moment in time, you're the best person to lead this. At this moment in time, you're the best person to keep us accountable. At this moment in time, yeah, this person or these people are best to do a certain thing. Um, in 2014, we, we took on a significant uh, operation. It was the startup of a, a rig called the Merce Viking at the time. It was the biggest drill ship in the world. Yeah. And... In, in one small thing, we worked out that when it came to well control, which is critical for the safety and well-being of any operation, a lot of people were glazing over when it was being discussed, and I was one. Yeah, I've been doing this a long while, but I didn't know enough about well control. And fortunately, one of the guys in my team, uh, his wife, gorgeous gal, um, is, was, was is a newsreader in, in Western Australia in Perth. Uh-huh. And Jasmine came up with this idea saying, look, after we do the news, I've got 10 or 15 minutes to keep the crew around. If you can pay for this um, small 10, 15 minutes of time, I can give you a studio, a production house, and we'll do something around well control. We called it Well Control Wednesday. Uh And it kicked off around little things around well control. And we had a rule, you can't go over three minutes and you've got to ask a question and you've got to have the crew respond and it's got to be a comedy and humour in it. Huh. What happened was over a period of of just weeks in doing this, we got all these questions around well control that people had no idea about. Yeah. And they were able to observe something over three minutes that you, you hadn't previously been able to get done in weeks or months or even years. And I learned so much out of it that once I started rolling it on with, with the clients is that they started to realise that there was this assumption of knowledge. Yeah. That we assumed that people had a knowledge and they never wanted to be tested. And we didn't want to test them because we feared what they would know or what they didn't know. Yeah. So finding a way to let this democratisation of teams say, why don't we try this? It, it ended up being gangbuster. And you can do it in any culture, in any language, as long as you let the team say, what is it that would help you this week? And you will find someone say, when it came to well control, I don't know what role the annulus plays. Yes. Or when someone says, we're sweeping the stack, what does that mean? Yeah. When someone says, um, you know, we've got to watch the shakers, I don't know what role that plays. And all these little things came together and it was such a revelation because we learned a ton, the crew... Um, interestingly enough, it was at Merce being a Danish company, saw things very differently. Uh-huh. Um, so they were very open-minded and I was just very grateful that the client at the time said, heck, I'm, I'm learning as I go and I'm enjoying it. So we went gangbusters on that. And it was just because we fell into something because we were a- afraid to ask the question because we knew the answer probably wouldn't confirm uh the, the basis that we should have held is that everyone knew what they were doing because yeah. they didn't. Yeah, which is a huge driver in safety. So it's both, it's democratizing the team behavior, but also democratizing knowledge um, to say it's okay. It's okay to get your knowledge from another colleague or a junior colleague because I think that's another problem you see in businesses. People like, well, I can't ask my staff member what this is because I should know it. I'm their boss. Um, so that's really cool too. It, it's really interesting and I've got two experiences in life. One is is obviously now I, I run a company that over the last 20 years we've operated in 25 different countries around the world. We've done 50 startups and we've had a heck of a lot of people involved. Yeah. And, and generally I'm the boss, I'm the largest shareholder of the company, so people will will want to do as I say because... That's their employment. Yeah. I, I try and disarm people as much as possible to say the only way we will succeed is if we're brutally honest. Not everyone will be brutally honest with me, no matter how much we try and create the environment for yeah. them to do so. In in a in a sporting world, which you may be familiar growing up in Australia, is that 
I'm involved in a voluntary organisation called Surf Lifesaving. It's where people give give their time to um, go to the beach and be amateur lifeguards or yeah. or volunteer lifeguards. And that can be your rural fire service. It can be anything where people come together, raise their hand and say, I will do something for the betterment of others. Well, in that, I was in a leadership position. I was a club captain. And you learn very, very quickly whether you had people on side or off side. Yeah. Because people can just tell you exactly what's on their mind. Yeah. And one thing I, over a period of 10 years, I was a club captain. When I first started out, I didn't know what I was doing and and I wasn't listening to others. At, by the end of it, I, I realised that I was good at a few things. I was good at understanding people. I was good at understanding what we needed to set as the vision. Yeah. And then thankfully, and it took me a long while to work it out, that I was not the best executor of everything that had to happen. So I needed yeah. to surround myself in the team. Who were the who was an engineer in their professional life? Who was the accountant? Who was the teacher? Who was um, a data-driven person? Who was where were the trades that were used to getting on with the job? Yeah. And, and once you learnt that as a team leader, you start to realise that you need to be a bit of a conductor. Uh -huh. And you need to say, okay, where, where's the where's the trumpets? Where's the violins? Where's the drums? Where's this? And you need to bring that together. If a, if if a leader or a manager doesn't realise that they can't do it all, yeah, and that they don't need, they don't realise that they're a conductor of an orchestra, they're really struggling. So that was a revelation to me about twenty years ago, and it's um it's helped me a long a long way in the last few years. Oh yeah, definitely. And I do love the. Uh, I've never. I've been a part of a surf life saving club, actually, just up the road from you at Long Reef in Sydney, right? In my right. early years, and it was good fun, but never got to that club captain level. But the friends of mine that have stayed in it, it's a great community. Um, you know, it's an important role, and there is a lot of, there's a lot of candor in those environments generally. There is candor, and it's. It, this comes back to the future of teams. Yeah. I really. Wherever people are listening to this, I encourage them to do voluntary work, to be a volunteer yeah. in society, yeah. because you will learn your influence. You will learn whether that influence is real or perceived. Yeah. Because when you are an appointed manager or an appointed leader in a company, um, that influence is, is given to you by the very nature of the firm. Yeah. When you become a leader in a voluntary organisation or a sporting body, whatever that is, where people aren't employed to do as you say, you learn very quickly what kind of influence you have. Yeah. Um, and, and I've learned that so well. And also your your position as a leader of a team is not forever. Yes. Everyone goes through a point of performance. And uh, for me, I, I knew on two different occasions that I'd had enough, that I'd run out of steam and I, and I quickly stepped down. Yeah. The, the challenge in organisations is that when they think they've appointed somebody to a certain position and they hang on to them too long rather than saying, you've run a great race, yeah. we need to get you off doing this and let someone else come in. And that doesn't necessarily mean to be someone young. It means to be someone who at that moment in time is the best person to influence others towards a meaningful goal that will bring people with them for the betterment of others. Yeah. And and that that's a interesting topic i've read some things in hbr around like 4.6 years as an average term for a publicly traded ceo and that type of thing but that concept of seasons for leaders it's not just public ceos there's leaders in all different levels of the organization but there are seasons and and i think coming out of covid that might be one of the other things we're seeing play into the great resignation i can see it with some of the folks on my team there's there's some people that are maybe a little bit tired or maybe aren't ready to, to take on the new way of leading post COVID with all this remote work. Um, and it's, you know, companies are very wedded to hierarchies and salary scales and, and, and they don't change quickly. They do hang on. So that, I think that's probably a, a big driver that we're going to see in the next year or two here as teams reorganize. We are going through such great change. It's yeah. just significant. Um, the the one thing that I I still can't get over, um, people who are leading organisations don't do is they don't maximise the opportunity for communication. 
most people have a very simple phone, you know, whether it's a, yeah. a an Apple phone or an Android phone, you can make a video on it. You can find someone within your organization online, whoever it is to edit that. Yeah. Um, you can have a small group of trusted people who um, may agree with you, may disagree with you and say, once a week, I want to put out a message to everyone on a Friday evening, Friday afternoon. Yep. Uh, I'm going to make it on my phone. Can you please have a look at it? Tell me wh- what's right, what's not right. Edit out whatever you need to do. Get it out. It, it costs nothing. Yeah. It takes a little bit of time. But it allows a team, you might have a team of 5, 10, 20 people, a few hundred, a few thousand, whatever that is, 10,000, 20,000 people. Yeah. But it allows people on a regular occasion to hear from the one person who is leading that organisation that can say, this is what ha- what's happened over the last seven days. This is what's happened over the last 14 days. Yeah. But you shouldn't leave it anything more than 21 days. But organisations don't do it. They put out press releases. They put out edicts. Yeah. They put out company results. They, they, more, they, they don't measure themselves, and this comes back to a, 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 a personal thing of mine, they don't measure themselves on meaningful results like happiness and well-being. Yeah, it, it, it is still a GDP, a gross domestic product, or a, a profit and loss. It's those things that are important, but they're not always sustainable. So, getting off the point a little bit here, but no. I I do think that ability for leaders to communicate is hugely important. I I think so too, and I actually think it goes a step beyond the leaders. I think it's it's team members too, because teams are often working together, but they don't really know what that other function in the business does or who that other person is. And I think, like you said, with the, the well control Wednesday, short videos can create so much more engagement and accessibility than, than traditional forms of, of sharing information in businesses. So I I don't think it's going off topic at all. I think it's a a really good direction. Just coming back to this well control Wednesday, uh, look, I, I learned a huge amount about my client the first time we did that in 2014, 2015, that there was just this belief and it wasn't, it wasn't a negative thing, a belief that people knew what they were required to do. Yeah. Certain people, when they're performing a task in an operation, like an offshore drilling rig, people know their job, but they don't necessarily know how that job impacts this job over here, this job over here, or this task over here. Yeah. And the ability to help people understand, I do this small role which allows this to function, this to function, this to function. And that's why you being able to do this is really important to me. Yeah. And and the, the, the clients that I was working with were so receptive to it all that as it came along, they said, man, you, you've got to broaden this out. You know, I want to hear everything and anything. Yeah. And it just allowed the democratisation of, of this team to be really, really embracing of, influence and power to the point that uh, we were involved in that rig. I thought it was going to be for 120, 180 days. We were there for roughly 18 months, two years. But wow. over that period of time, the Merce Viking was the most successful rig startup in the, the IADC, the International Association of Drilling Contractors, for uh-huh. a 12-month period. It was the most successful for Merce. And, and importantly, from an economic point of view, it had the less downtime, it had the, the less incidents of any rig that was being run by the client, which was ExxonMobil at the time, over that running 12-month period. Now, did we did we make that happen? No, I wouldn't say we did. But we contributed to an atmosphere that allowed people to resolve issues openly because they saw someone on a little vignette, a little video, yeah. that they didn't know that well and they'd go up to the barge master or they'd go up to the captain or they'd go up to a roustabout or a roughneck or someone was doing something saying, um, I don't understand what you're doing, but why why do I need to be doing this for you? And yeah. they'd explain it to me. I never knew. Yeah. And that's how it is in companies. I, you know, I, I have asked things of my, uh, my accounts department before or diff department and, and they say, why are you asking for that? I say, well, I, I need to know this. And then they can't execute it because I've never explained it properly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen it a lot too. I, not only at work, but also at home <laughs> with my wife when I'm like, I need this. Well, why do you need it? Oh, for this reason. Oh, well, I could have done it this way for you and you wouldn't need that. Oh, I wish I'd told you that a week ago. 
Yeah, it's. I, I just come back to so many of the learnings I've had um, have been exposed to me in in non employed environments where people yes. are brutally honest with you. Yeah, um, and I've learnt. I, I had an interesting uh, gap in my in my life just for personal reasons. Um, I, I took time out between 2004 and 2008 and I took a contract with the Australian Defence Force to do pre-deployment training for uh, Australian Army officers um, in the Middle East. I, I can't go into it, but yeah. I just learnt a ton from people who had perceptions that what they were doing was right because that is what their chain of command wanted. Their chain of command had never said that, but it was this perceived instruction of command without yeah. being there yeah so i learned a lot that there is there is perception of perceived expectations that are not necessarily there and you've got to help people work through that you've got to help people understand situational awareness and the importance of asking good questions and then critical thinking sometimes you need to you know be responsive and other times you need to just back off my yeah my mum pre-computer age always said you know uh, write that letter and then yes. send it in the morning yeah now i i wish i still did that but it's such an important thing because people will be pressing send on an email at 8 9 10 11 12 at night yeah. when really they should just say i'll let it sit i'll get up in the morning i'll go for a walk i'll have a stretch i'll meditate i'll do some yoga i'll do whatever and i'll come yeah. back to it and go you know it's a bit harsh yeah or you know I might get on the phone. I, you know, I'd rather get on the phone. I, I wish I did that more. I don't do it enough. And um, I, Me too. I just just got off the phone to my mum last night, so that's what's reminding <laughs> me of that. There are always uh, wise tips, those tips from our parents and uh, our mentors who have yes, seen correct. it in a different time of technology and, uh, you know, probably a different time of, of complexity as well, to be honest. Um, but there's some great practices. Yeah, we, we bring up this term mentors, which when you and I were, were young, it really, there weren't this, nope. this expectation that you could have a mentor. Now companies expect it. Yeah. Um, as we tr transition workforces over, there's a lot that older people can learn from younger people, younger people from older people. And it's just finding that right balance of having a mentor and a mentee. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time in, involved in that space over the last... 24 months, um, I, I have a few friends that are, are in significant positions in the corporate world globally. And I've, I've said the same thing is that you, you've got to allow companies to say, we, we need this to happen, but don't control it. Allow yeah. people to find the people that they'll gel with. And yes. that will allow teams to regenerate and refunction and, and move in directions that will, will benefit the company, will benefit those people that are in an organisation looking for change, looking for growth, if you don't control it and just provide pathways for it to be accelerated. Uh, I think that's so organic and so necessary right now. It's hard. It's been such a good conversation, Simon. Thanks again for joining me today. It's hard to summarise. You know, there's so many cool little snippets that we've touched on from, you know, perceived status, um, from learning where your influence is with voluntary work, uh, that that sort of riff that we did on democratizing teams and knowledge and and helping bring out the engagement of those teams through some video interaction. There's there's so much good stuff we've covered here today um, that I think influences you know the future of teamwork. So thank you for uh, for joining and and uh, thanks for letting me start the conversation with a bit of talk about surfing in Indonesia too. Good on you. Thanks so much, Dane. All thanks, best. Simon. Thanks. Yes.